I would now like to call the June 16th, 2021 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Can we please start with a roll call? Yes, joining us today are Kay Collardson Chair, Jim Here. Metcalf Vice Chair, uh, Charles Musgrave and Adam Reed as board members. And then staff members joining us today are Lisa Knobloch, Annie Noble, Francie Jeffy, Tim Ellis, and Phil Greenwald. Our city council liaison is Polly Christensen. And then public in attendance will be Brian Jeffries and Monty Whaley. Thank you. And do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, does anybody want to motion to approve those? I will move to approve the meetings from the minutes from the last meeting. I'll second that. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. And uh, the motion is passed. Okay. Um, so I will now open it up uh, for the public invited to be heard. Each person uh, speaking will be unmuted one at a time. When it is your turn to speak, please state your name and address for the record. Uh, you will have three minutes for comment. I will time you and please, I, I'll interrupt you if you're still talking at three minutes. And if you continue to talk, you will be muted. Um, so please go ahead and all right, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute yourself. And as the chair stated, please state your name and address for the record and you have three minutes. Hi, this is Brian Jeffries, 4027 Milano Lane, Longmont. I've read the draft questions posed for the Platte River Power, Power Authority that are shown in today's meeting packet. If that list has already been sent to the Platte River Power Authority, then my comments would follow are moot. Uh, if that's the case, I can stop now. So can you tell me whether that list has already been sent or not? Lisa, do you? Yeah, the list has already been sent. Then I've got nothing to say. Thank you. OK. Um. Then um, are there, there's no one else to be uh, from the public who wishes to be heard. Is that true stuff? That is correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any uh, revisions to the agenda or documents to submit from the staff? Yeah, I have one revision to the agenda. I would like to under items from staff add a letter of support uh, for a DOE grant. Great. Okay, I'll make sure and add that. Okay. Um, we move on then to general business. Um, I'll ask board members to please hold their comments and questions until the end of each presentation after uh, the staff has finished presenting. So first up is uh, the US 287 bus rapid transit feasibility study. Um, Jeff Butts, the floor is yours. Or Bill Greenwald. Well, good afternoon, um, uh, Chair and members of the, uh, of the board. Just wanted to let you know that I've been trying to get a hold of Jeff Butts and uh, he is not available at this time. So uh, if you'd like to move on to your other items, we can certainly do that. And I will continue to try to get a hold of Jeff and see if he's okay and um, and see if he needs any assistance getting onto the meeting today. So I apologize, um, but we uh, cannot track down Jeff. So um, if we can move on, that would be wonderful. And then I will let you know when uh, he's available. Sounds good. Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much. Okay, Lisa. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Hopefully everything's okay and that wasn't some sort of miscommunication on our end, but we'll, we'll circle back with you all if, if we don't hear from him today. 
Um, okay, so Steph, if I could have you pull up my presentation, that would be great. Excellent. All right, so I just wanted to take some time today to give you all a brief update on our zero waste, waste efforts and get some preliminary feedback on updating the zero waste resolution, which I'll get into in a minute here. So you can go to the next slide, please. Great. Oops, sorry, I'm having my own tech issues. Um, so our sanitation staff brought an update on zero waste efforts to council um, back in the earlier part of the year. They identified four main areas of focus, uh, which are education and outreach. Um, and if you hit the right arrow, is this a PDF or is a PowerPoint stuff? I realized I put an animation and forgot to specify that. So if it's a no worries, it's, it is the PowerPoint. Great. So if you hit the right arrow, it should come up. There we go. Ooh. All right. So the main focus in education and outreach is the Green Star Schools program, which we do in partnership with EcoCycle and the St. Rain Valley School District. Uh, for the last couple of years, we have been funding uh, one new school to be added per year. And within Longmont city boundaries. And then the St. Rain Valley School District also funds one school that could be anywhere in the district. So may or may not be within Longmont. And we just increased our budget to add an additional school to that. So now moving forward, there will be three schools per year added to the Green Star Schools program. It's a great comprehensive program that focuses on composting and recycling education and services for the schools. Uh, the next is the Hard to Recycle program. So if you hit the right arrow again, um, the main focus there is just increasing opportunities within Longmont for hard to recycle materials. Uh, the zero waste resolution, can hit the right arrow. That's the main focus that we'll be talking about today. And then the universal recycling ordinance, if you want to hit the right arrow, <laughs> it's a lot harder to do animation when you're not doing it yourself. Um, it will uh, largely be um, a good part of that the foundation of the universal recycling ordinance we, ordinance we anticipate incorporating into the zero waste resolution. Um, and those are all happening over the next 12 to 18 months. So you can go to the next slide, please. As you all probably know, because we've talked about this quite a bit, uh, the, um, the Climate Action Task Force also had a focus on zero waste efforts, particularly on composting. Um, so that was a priority. We will incorporate that into the zero waste resolution, which we'll talk about more shortly. So you can go to the next slide. And then also uh, waste is a specific focus area within the sustainability plan. We, we do have a lot going on in this area. Uh, the targets are listed here that are from the sustainability plan. If you hit the right arrow, we have some more animation. Um, so we've actually met our household trash consumption goal, which is pretty exciting. So we'll be revisiting that when we update the sustainability plan. Uh, if you want to hit the right arrow again, uh, we're doing pretty well on the residential waste diversion goal. And I think if you hit it one more time, there we go. Um, so we're at about 40% and we have a goal to reach 50% by 2025. So um, we're doing pretty well with that. We have good participation in our recycling and composting programs that help us a lot there. Uh, and then we are doing a lot internally, as well as with the commercial sector, largely through the sustainable business program. Um, but we still have been working to define baselines in those areas. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a quick overview of all of the strategies around the waste um, topic that are in the sustainability plan. So you can see uh, focus on composting and recycling, waste re regional waste management work, educational opportunities. Uh, you'll see the com commercial recycling ordinance in, in there and hard to recycle materials as well. Next slide. So mostly, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about updating the zero waste resolution today. Uh, this is in just an overview of the timeline. So we started this process in May of what we committed to council was to have this done in a 12 month time frame. So uh, anticipating having the final resolution completed by June of 2022. Um, so we reviewed their existing uh, resolution. We've been doing some research on examples from other communities, put together the draft timeline that you all saw in your packet. And now we're moving into the stakeholder engagement section, which is mostly just getting some high level information 
um, as we'll talk about on what people want to see included in that resolution. We'll take it back to council uh, early fall. And then we'll go through a period of doing some data analysis and um, additional goal setting. So we really want to build off those goals we already have in the sustainability plan, uh, but hopefully identify some new goals as well. Um, circle back with stakeholders and then finalize the resolution and bring it to council next year, next summer. Um, and then go through communications process and we'll be looking to incorporate that into the Envision and Sustainability Plan updates as well. Next slide. So this is just very high level. The existing resolution, as you all saw, was from 2008. It was, it was a pretty good resolution. It had a lot of stuff in there. These are just the high level components um, that talked about existing conditions, what the impacts were, um, why we should care about it. They had some guiding principles included, and then some very um, high level tactics kind of focus on in there. I'm not gonna go through all the details because you all have that in your packet. You wanna go to the next slide. So then looking at revising and updating that resolution, you'll see similar um, components around the background, similar things that we would wanna be looking at in that area as well. What we wanna, what we are looking to focus on that would be um, the primary difference is really incorporating some pretty specific goals that can help guide our work. So looking to the zero waste resolution as kind of being that foundation for our zero waste work. So we have our existing sustainability plan goals that I just mentioned, um, but as we go through this process, we'll identify if we want, if it makes sense to add additional goals to that as well. And then from the tactic standpoint, we have the same plans, programs, policies, and infrastructure components, um, but really a focus on stakeholder engagement as well and identifying those equity impacts and community needs. Um, so this time I'll go ahead and have Steph pull up the draft outline. And we'll walk you through that. So you also saw this in the packet. So hopefully you all have had a chance to at least digest it a little bit. Um, and while she does that, what I'm what we're looking for at this point, and unfortunately, Charlie Caminitas, who's our sanitation manager, wasn't able to join us today. Um, but we're just looking for some very high level feedback on these um, components that I've included here, what might be missing, and then if there are specific items that you think that we should be considering within those components. Um, and then we'll flesh those out um, in detail, especially as we get through the data analysis process and bring it to you all for further feedback as, as this progresses. Um, so we'll kind of run through here and then feel free um, to just holler out if you have questions or comments um, in each of these sections. And I can kind of, we can just, uh, I guess we can't, we can't take notes here, but Francie is taking notes separately. So I'll incorporate your comments in here. Um, but that background is just the overarching issue of waste. Um, why should we care about it? Um, the existing conditions, so we want to talk about what are our statistics that we know of currently, our waste volume, our diversion rates, we have all the statistics around what the current participation is in our different programs. Uh, the impacts on Longmont, so we talked to you several months ago when we completed the waste life cycle cost analysis that has some really good detailed impacts from a greenhouse gas um, and climate action um, standpoint. So if there's other things we want to include there um, around community impacts as well, we could include that. And then the value proposition is looking at the climate impact, community benefits, um, convenience that comes out of additional uh, programs or whatever it might be, and then really the long-term value to the city and really investing in waste diversion efforts and becoming a zero waste community. Um, before I move on to the next section, oh, sorry, Steph. Are there any comments or additions that folks want to make in this section here? I, I had a quick question. Um, do we have um, like comparisons like to other communities, maybe model community? For example, I think the target was two pounds per person per day of waste. Do we know how that compares to other communities? Is that ambitious? Is that? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, that in particular is pretty ambitious and Longmont is doing pretty well on that. The caveat I will say to that is it's not standard in the way that that's being calculated across communities. And so that's one of the things that we actually wanna look at when we update the sustainability plan and we look to revisit that goal is has that 
moved in terms of best practice in, uh, in the way that it's calculated because it, it really depends on what all gets rolled into that particular calculation in order to be able to compare that across communities. And at least when we did it initially, there wasn't a standard. Um, so that's one of the challenges for sure in being able to do that comparison. Um, there is also EcoCycle did a comparison across all the municipalities within Boulder County and pulled a lot of this information. So we do have some pretty good comparative information, at least across the county. So, so I'm, I'm guessing that we would include um, the, the way we're, the definition of how we're going to calculate waste per day per person. Yeah, probably not to that level of detail in the resolution, but that when we actually go to increase in revisiting that goal, yes. Yeah. Got it, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we can move on to the goals section. Can I, can I actually can just you, ask okay. one question? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. You'll um, have to jump in because I can't see everybody. Yeah, I was, I was realizing that as we're on this <laughs> view. Um, so um, I, this might be just a follow-up then, to Charles' question with that the the way that we calculate our, our waste is that is that just looking at the amount of waste that is hauled from our city cans like the ones that I put out every week or does that include free dump day and does that yep. include okay it includes all of the above everything that oh, we can track and we do get information um, I would say it, it's not going to be the most accurate, but we do get information from our commercial haulers as well. They're required to put data into a, a system that we, a countywide system that we can at least have some general information about that. Yeah, Adam. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for this discussion. Um, what's still not clear to me, does this number also include, say, some of the recycled materials that end up not getting recycled? They just end up getting thrown away. Is that something that can be tracked? Y yes. Not on a, on, we have to go through specifically and every, and Charlie would be able to tell you with the frequency. I don't know what frequency this is, but we do um, go through a waste audit every so often to give ourselves an idea of how much um, recyclable or composted material is going into the landfill. So that it just gives us kind of a, a ballpark idea of that, but it's not something that's tracked on an ongoing basis. Yeah, but that's a critical piece of information for us to have. Yeah. Okay, great. The goals section, you wanna pull that back up, Steph? Thank you, and I see Jeff joined us, so that's great. We'll, I'll hand it back to him when I'm done with this. Um, so as I mentioned, I just dropped in the existing goals, and then I do think that we'll probably be looking at additional goals um, particularly, as I mentioned, in the city operations and the commercial side of things, our goals are just the increased diversion in those areas. But I think we really want to be able to add through that data analysis piece some more specific um, actual targets to that um, section there. Um, and then the last section is the tactics. So as I mentioned, this the update to the resolution really focuses a lot more on the stakeholder engagement side and really understanding those equity issues and considerations and what are the community needs. We know the area of multifamily units is a big area of focus for folks because it's been really hard to get recycling and composting services um, to folks that are living in apartment complexes and whatnot. So that's an area that we'll wanna look at. And then that high level approach in terms of, do we want to establish some specific plans like a solid waste management plan or a zero waste plan? Um, a number of different programs, uh, including partnerships with folks like EcoCycle and others. Um, policies so we can look at code updates and then that's where that universal recycling ordinance would come in. And what that does is essentially um, require everyone to have recycling service. Um, to their, so all commercial entities and stuff would have recycling available. Uh, and then C and D, sorry, I should have spelled that out, not the acronym, but that's construction and demolition, which is a huge, um, uh, a huge waste stream. Uh, and from a volume and weight standpoint has a pretty big impact. And then the infrastructure piece and looking at partnerships and regionalization of our waste infrastructure. Um, so that's pretty much what we're looking at. Are there any other comments kind of in that section that people wanna add or have questions about? No. Okay, great. Well, we will we'll circle back with um, 
actually, if you want to bring up that the presentation step, I have one last slide because our next step is really the stakeholder engagement piece. Uh, we know there's a good handful of folks that have a lot of interest in this area. So I, I dotted down the folks that we've come up with, but definitely if you have other people that we or groups that we should be considering, uh, please let us know. There you go. So obviously we have a lot of staff from across the organization that are impacted in different ways that we wanna make sure are engaged and have different um, needs and, and uh, considerations in this area. You all, the Equitable Climate Action Team, Sustainable Resilient Longmont has a zero waste uh, committee that we'll be touching base with. Um, the business community will be working with Bernice to understand what are the needs in that area. Uh, the Sustainability Coalition, the Boulder County Resource Conservation Board, which is a group with representation from across the municipalities in the county that looks at these issues as well, um, really from a regional standpoint, and then looking at um, engaging the community broader, broader, more broadly through our Engage Longmont page. Um, are there other groups that you all are connected to or that you know of that we should add to this list from a stakeholder engagement standpoint? Yes, Bernice. Lisa, this is Bernice. I think we should also engage howlers, like Western yep. disposal, ecocycle, waste connections. Yep, perfect. Great. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Great. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, as we get into the, the more substantive details of this, we'll be, we'll be bringing it back to you all uh, as well. And with that, I am going to hopefully hand it over to Jeff. Okay. Um, Jeff, uh, if you are ready we would love to hear an update on the um the 287 uh rapid transit feasibility study jeff are you there Jeff is unmuted, but I do not see, I cannot hear him either, so. <laughs> uh, I'm here, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah no. we just can't yeah. see you. And now you can't see me. I'm getting failed to start video camera settings. Okay, so the host asked me to start my camera. My camera is turned on and it's green, so um, I don't know what is going on here. Um, sorry, I've Zoom. I, this is why I was late. I was having issues. So my apologies. Uh, we may just, let me try switching some cameras around here. Can you see what's on the screen, Jeff? Uh, I see you, Phil. I see, see, I see Phil Greenwald as your name, but I, I can see what's on the screen. If you want to move forward with the presentation, I can give the presentation. Sorry that I'm unable to share my video. I Zoom is just, <laughs> it's been giving me every problem of the day so far, I guess, trying to connect. So um, I'll just move forward without video if that's okay. Um, I appreciate all of you allowing me to be here with and spend some time with you. Um, this is going to be my first time really working through uh, the presentation, not having the controls, so hopefully it works. This is... Uh, really designed to be a conversation to hear from you all as a part of our process um, for designing uh, bus rapid transit uh, along 287 and, and additional uh, treatments. And so I guess just one thing to note on sustainability and hearing you talk about waste reduction, uh, it's kind of uh, an old world of mine in college. I actually got recycling going at the university like full recycling is the chair of the urban or the environmental awareness club. So I was, so I, 
love the work you guys do and uh, there's a place in my heart for it. So I appreciate you having me here. Um, talk about 287 today. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, actually, let's go to number four. If we can move ahead to number four. One more. Sorry. Here we go. Um, so um, these, I... I Sorry about the train. I live in Longmont, and so the train is driving by right now. Um, and the reason why I have these scattered, we're taking the public presentation really uh, that we gave and then trying to tailor to each group so each group understands. And I just want to have this be a visual aid uh, more so than a presentation. But there is a little bit of upfront stuff here that I want to walk through. So first of all, this. This explains the county's transportation master plan, which shows uh, prioritizing the movement of people over cars, uh, advancing the Northwest Area Mobility Study, and then working with our partners, such as Longmont has been a great partner, uh, and of course, funding. Uh, next, next slide, please. And so this shows the North, uh, Northwest Area Mobility Study. You can see on here how, uh, there's 119, and if you need to zoom in, you can hit control and then zoom in on your mouse, and usually that allows you to zoom in if you need to see closer, neat trick. Um, but you can see the network of uh, bus rapid transit that is planned for the area. Uh, the yellow line is 119, which is the most uh, furthest along, I guess. And then the red line is seven, which is the second. And now this orange line right down the middle is um, the, really the spine of the entire network. And when you think about sustainability, um, having sustainable mobility options helps tie right in there. You know, if people get out of their cars and if we find a way to get people into, into a bus instead, then that will save save some trips so next slide or save some carbon and i just want to acknowledge all of our partners that are working on this and then if you could advance two slides please um and i, I want to note that this is in english and spanish when we gave the presentation originally there's an option at the bottom for people to be able to uh, change from English and Spanish. So we had live. So that's that's why the Spanish is on here. Uh, if you look to the map on the right, you can see that there's two areas. There's a blue line that extends all the way from Fort Collins down to Denver. And that is where there is service right now. Uh, there's transit service connecting those areas right now. And then when the middle from 66 down to 36, you can see there's a second line, which is a gold color and that is the area where we're also looking at capital treatments and so what can we do for service from Fort Collins to Denver and then what capital treatments can we make uh, along the way or in, in the middle and then if you can advance uh, one more slide uh, here we go these these are these are the big issues that we've been hearing people talk about when we are in our um, uh, public meetings and through surveys. Uh, these are the major intersections that are issues and just major problems. Arapaho, I probably no surprise there. Uh, and then South Boulder, uh, really nothing in Longmont that I see, which is good for you all, except for the pedestrian friendliness, something that has been coming up consistently is it's not pedestrian friendly and the highway divides the community, including in Longmont, of course, there's east side and west side, which is divided. Um, and so now if we can move along to the, uh, let's see here, next slide. And so what I want to show here is that of our survey respondents, which was around 77, there was strong support for our, um, for, for moving forward with these treatments and things. So this is where I want to pause. Sometimes I, uh, I do Mentimeter here. 
Um, sometimes I don't. And um, this time we're not because it's recorded. But I want to take a moment and ask you all, uh, what are the top things we should consider when planning transit enhancements along 287? So this is a moment for discussion. If you feel comfortable, just how can we help tie into your sustainability goals and what should, what should we really be considering? Uh, Jeff, can I ask a, a question? Um, uh, what, what's the time frame that you're thinking about implementing this plan? Yeah, great, excellent question. And so the study itself is going to go into Q3 of this year. So August, September, potentially October. And then we're going to start a second phase of the study, which is going to put safety as the primary um, emphasis. And so it'll be safety, uh, multimodal mobility and environmental. Those are to be the three things we look at. And when we look at environmental um, habitat, sensitive areas, making sure we don't disturb those. Um, and then also if there's, and we're gonna include stakeholder engagement and bilingual stakeholder engagement throughout the process. So um, we may also include traffic signals, we may not in that second phase. And then that phase is, will be a year to 18 months. So, so that's the study, um, how, but, but it's a study. And I, I'm, I'm, I imagine that uh, depending upon what the outcomes are of that study in terms of um, you know, what, what plan comes out, that, that um, there'd be implementa you know, the implementation would depend upon you know, how much, you know, what is needed in terms of construction or what is needed in terms of um, you know, <clears throat> uh, adding bus service, et cetera. But is this something we're looking, you know, three years out, five years out? I think it's what it seems to be coming to the top is there's going to be a variety. So 119 is going to be one large project at once. And this is probably going to be taking advantage of projects as they rise to the surface. So, for example, if there's a intersection reconfiguration within Longmont, um, that's already an existing one, then the recommendations of the study can be implemented. Down in Broomfield, uh, they already have some turning lanes on the outside, so that's just new paint, so that could be something within a year. Um, it, some transit queue jumps, if you're aware of what those are, so the transit is able to bypass, the, the bus is able to bypass everybody and then jump to the front of the line. Um, that may happen in certain areas uh, quicker than other areas. So there will be some things that will probably happen within, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but within two years, um, you sh we should be able to start to see some changes happen uh, in areas. And then for the full scale, when's it done and when are the stations built and everything, I I would optimistically say 10 years, but that's, that's very optimistic. Um, I would say 10, maybe 20 years for the full build out. This is the third priority. So we have 119 that still needs to be built and then we have seven and then we have this one. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. So implementation is important and being able to see stuff on the ground. Are there other things that we should consider or are there other questions? Adam. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I did have a question about how you plan on making the buses faster. I noticed that you said something about um, adding another lanes for the buses. Are you planning on, I mean, are you looking into expanding, say, the width of 287 or are you planning on having um, the bus just go on the side of the road like they do on US 36. Can we skip to slide 30, please? And then share the screen once you're there. If you can just jump to 30 or maybe you have to scroll through them all. There we go. So, so this, this is an example of what we have at NIWA. We're not saying that we are going to do this at NIWA station, 
but we're these are the different types of treatments we're looking at. So uh, this is how it exists. Next slide, please. This would be the outside option, which is the most likely option. Um, and so you would have Q jumps and maybe some areas with some bus only where it makes sense. But so outside and then next slide, please. Inside. So these are really the two different treatments. So if you want to go to the previous slide. And then again, the next slide. So this, this is where we're at. So if we stay on the outside, there really is less widening of the roadway. Um, if you, but the pedestrian has a long ways to cross. And if you go with the center running, um, it's, it, it needs more right of way, which is of course difficult, but you could give a pedestrian refuge as well. So it kind of breaks up the street in the middle. Does that help? Okay, great. Excellent. Hey, Jim. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, you know, uh, uh, in the last year, I think it was maybe early or late winter or something like that, Governor Polis kind of uh, asked us to, or asked the RTD to re-examine the uh, train service expansion from Denver out to Boulder and Longmont and that whole area and try to push up the time frame. I was wondering how changes in kind of the planning for rail systems would impact planning for the bus rapid transit systems at all, or if that might change priorities. You know, it's all designed to work as a network together. And so none of these things are exclusive of one another. It's not that we are building bus rapid transit in place of the train. And it's not that the, the train would replace the bus rapid transit. The idea is to build a network that works seamlessly together. So somebody could take the train, for example, to Broomfield, get off at Broomfield, and then be able to head up to Lafayette on the bus. So that's, that's so all of it work together as a network solution. So every piece of it builds upon it. Yeah, does that help answer your question? Excellent, okay. So, so Jeff, oh, sorry. Uh, so I am, um, you know, so the one, one, of the, one of the reasons I was asking about time frame is because I'm, I'm just wondering about, um, you know, technology as it advances and there, there could be some interesting technologies that come out in the next 10 or 15 years or sooner that could impact, um, you know, some of these things. And, you know, this is, this is one that <clears throat> there's, it's kind of controversial, but the autonomous systems and autonomous, you know, self-driving vehicles could come out. And, you know, we've seen even over this last year, I, I, I'm not sure what the statistics are locally, but ridership is probably down significantly during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, a lot of people bought, bought used cars and things like that in order to be able to transport themselves because they, they didn't want to ride buses uh, during the pandemic. And it's going to take, take some time to get back um, to higher ridership's. But, um, you know, there's a possibility that if uh, autonomous systems come out, you know, self-driving cars, that services, you know, similar to Uber and Lyft, et cetera, but not with, you know, no human drivers could come out and make, uh, you know, tr transportation per, you know, per mile um, for those kinds of services, very inexpensive. And you can imagine compete with uh, municipal transportation. Is that something that comes up at all in these, in the thinking of these, these kinds of long-term plans? So thinking about how we can work with TNCs, transportation network carriers, um, I think is the name of them, uh, Uber, Lyft, um, is something that we consider. We also do consider how to, what, what autonomy is going to do. And there's really two different types of autonomy. You have automatic, uh, which is more of a expert AI, where the experts decide every if then scenario. And then you have neural network, which is Tesla and comma AI. And so it depends on which one of those you go with, I think. And uh, the, it's, it's a crystal ball. Uh, we are heard technology is important and to consider technology for the traffic signals, 
for sure. Uh, if we could get to a place where we could have autonomous buses, um, that would that that would reduce the cost of running the buses. And so um, I think that all, all of those, you know, and when we have full autonomy, we won't even need traffic signals anymore is what Steve Tuttle tells me. He's a traffic engineer. So, it, uh, you know, we, we're, we're talking on the five, 10 year timeline with this project. And those things are probably going to slowly incorporate into the next 30 to 50 years. We're going to be seeing more and more of them. And so we'll just see how it develops and, and work to incorporate uh, transportation. Phil, you have your hand raised. Oh, I didn't want to take, I didn't want to take anybody's time. Um, I wanted the chair to be sure that that was okay. Uh, yeah, my ahead. apologies, but I just wanted to jump in and just talk about, you know, there's the autonomous vehicle kind of utopia, and then there's the autonomous vehicle kind of dystopia, which mm -hmm. is that feeling of, you know, I think Jeff mentioned that the zero occupancy vehicle that there's nobody in it, but it's driving somewhere to go pick somebody up and it's taking space on the road. So, um, you know, same thing with Uber and Lyft. I mean, it's a one person driving. And so we just have to be careful that the idea is, especially when we're talking to a sustainability advisory board, is we don't see that there's going to be a, that there's going to be a need for much more roadway widening, especially in Longmont. And so the idea is how do we get people on mass transit you know, regardless of the pandemic, I understand that was a thing that that really affected and it was really almost sad to hear the CDC come out and say, avoid public transportation. And so we need to kind of move on and get to the next level of how do we how do we deal with a pandemic type situation and still be able to use our mass transportation because it's 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 extremely critical that we move people in all the variety modes that we possibly can and not limit to people to a personal, you know, private vehicle, usually driven by one person, quite frankly. So that's what we're trying to move toward here. And, um, you know, on both the 119 and the US 36 example, and I believe on, on uh, State Highway 7, we're really looking to uh, expand it so that vehicles can also be told. So T-O-L-L-E-D, -L -L -E told. Um, so that if you do want to drive alone, if that's your, if that's your, if that's your preference, if that's your, your, what you've chosen for your, for your ride that day, uh, and you're willing to pay a price for your trip reliability, you can get into these lanes as well. And I'm, I'm not saying that's going to happen on 287, but I'm also not saying it's not going to happen on 287. We don't know. So that's a reason for this study as well. And, and, uh, and my apologies, I've taken a lot of your time. So I want to turn it back over to the board for comments. Yeah, thank you. Um, Adam and then Polly. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to change gears quickly and look at not the transportation itself, but rather the transit centers. Does this project encompass the Longmont Park and Ride and doing anything to that? I know there's a facility in South Longmont, but I'm not sure at what level it's being used. With the modeling, so we are heavily dependent on the great work that city staff has done to prepare for this. There's been just a lot of excellent work done. And so we are incorporating those and we are letting Longmont take the lead, but because it's Longmont, you know, it's, and so um, we're, we're incorporating those into this, but, uh, and maybe making some suggested modifications, but, um, we're showing the stations down there and then trying to figure out the speeds. Phil, do you have anything you want to add to that around the transit centers? Yeah, just to let you know, I mean, we've been working with RTD for a long time now to try to figure out something to do with that station area. Uh, the building's obviously dilapidated and needs lots of work. Uh, they still have a pretty good garage in there with a car wash, with a bus wash and, and fueling facility and, and a lot of things that could really help. They're talking about being over capacity at their Boulder maintenance facility right now, which is out there on 33rd and, and Arapahoe, basically. So we've talked to them about maybe, you know, putting this back into service, but keeping our park and ride. And then we'd want to do some really good pedestrian connections across 287, across Main Street, in order to uh, facilitate those buses running uh, quicker in front of that station and being able to get people on and off the buses uh, 
comfortably and safely. Great, thanks, Phil. And um, more broadly, we are including a stations area toolkit, um, which we're just developing, which has a lot of placemaking elements to it, mostly uh, to make it comfortable for people to be at these stations uh, and around them. And there may be some stations that have two or three elements and at least a bench and covering. And then there may be some stations that have 10 elements or so. And so us outside of Longmont and something that could be broadly applied. Um, so when you talk about transit centers, um, we're looking sort of at the stations themselves outside of Longmont and inside of Longmont if Longmont wants to use it, just a toolkit we're developing alongside it. Thanks. Polly. Okay, so um, since you brought this up, Adam, uh, actually city council, uh, particularly uh, Joan Peck has been working on um, a transit center at first and uh, main, which would be the buses, but well, we hope the, li the light rail would be coming in um, between Kaufman and main and at first Avenue. And uh, RTD has, we have $18 million that we can use for that. We've been buying up land to provide that. And they were going to give us a clock tower. And we said, no, we need a building because it snows. And because, you know, every other place has an actual place to park, a place to go inside, grab a drink and sit down and whatever, you know. So that has been going on for uh, at least the last eight years. Um, it's slow because of RTD, but, you know. So what I wanted to say is in regard to autonomous vehicles, if you have vehicles on the road, it doesn't matter who's driving them, they're on the road. And the part, the reason we have so much traffic is because we keep making the roads wider and bigger and we need to get them off the road into a discrete form of travel, which is what light rail is. And everywhere else that I've ever lived and traveled, um, everybody does take mass transit because it's easier, it's cheaper, it's more efficient. And as um, uh, Mr. Butts has said, that the idea is that you connect a series of different kinds of transport from subways to, um, to uh, light rail to maybe a bit, then, uh, you know, the last mile or whatever is a bus or a taxi or a bike or whatever, but you have to get people around in a massive way first. And if you're going to, if we're going to keep on talking about our own little vehicles, we're never going to get anywhere. We can't afford to build these roads and we're destroying Colorado by building more and wider and all these roads that we don't need if we just used mass transit more. We had better mass transit in 1880 in terms of trains than we have now. We had better bus systems for getting around Colorado in 1972. I could get up on a bus in Denver and get out to Meeker. I can't do that anymore. I would have to go I mean, I'm just saying this is, we've gone backwards. We need to actually go forward to mass transit and understand that this is the only way sustainable is sustainably we can get out of the traffic situations and the building of roads and uh, constantly trying to maintain those roads with uh, no gas tax anymore. I mean, because if, you know, Who's going to, how are we going to finance that if we don't have a gas tax because we're using electricity? So I just think there are many, many things to consider about uh, autonomous vehicles uh, being the solution to all of our problems. Thanks for that, Polly. I second what she said. Um, uh, Charles. Yeah, so so a couple of questions. I um, 
So I commute by bicycle between Longmont and Boulder. Um, and when the weather's not good, I take the bus. <clears throat> and so I, I have uh, quite a bit of experience, uh, you know, 13 years of experience commuting back and forth. And I know this is 287 and not uh, going down the diagonal, but I think there's a lot of similarities. And some, some things just, I think, to be aware of is um, making sure, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the details are, but making sure that, um, that when pedestrians have the potential to come into contact with traffic as they go uh, from park and rides, for example, to uh, the station, that there, there's either a way, you know, a safe way that they could get across. You, you show that station, Niwot in 287. Seems to me, I've read several <laughs> articles in the newspaper over the uh, last few years where, you know, there seems to be some f fatal accidents in those, those areas. Um, and so, and that's with just motorcycles and cars and trucks and things like that. But yeah, so I'm, I was really happy to see that safety was a priority there. Um, I, the diagonal is, um, it almost seems like there's almost no safety features to travel along the diagonal between Boulder and Longmont, um, especially at intersections. Um, it's, uh, I don't know who designed it, but it probably wasn't a cyclist. But I would hope that um, whatever's done along the 287 corridor, that there's, uh, you know, that there's um, uh, some precautions that are taken in terms of the design to make sure that it's, it's just safe for anyone who's using that corridor for transportation, cyclists, pedestrians, et cetera. Because if you have buses and cars and cyclists and pedestrians um, uh, on that, um, basically in the same surfaces and there's no separation that, uh, you know, fat fatalities are tragedies that um, be great to design uh, to avoid those. Thank you. And I just want to make a note that that is the most important issue um, to Boulder County and to me personally, and probably to Phil and to every transportation planner and engineer. When there's a fatality that's not just a life, it's a family, it's a friend. So it's extremely important and not just for people driving their cars, but also for people walking their bicycles. It's so important that in this phase, we've decided to do a second phase that is going to highlight safety as its primary feature and safety in multimodal mobility. Meaning, you know, how do we, make it safe for people to walk and bike and drive and predictable and get to the bus stops and around the bus stops. So thank you for, um, thank you for raising that. I just like to get a time check. I have two more questions that I want to get through. I don't want to rush you all, but I don't want to, I don't want to overtake your time. I just, oh. I ha have two more and just want to make sure that um, we have time to get to them. Please. You want me to move on? Yeah, I, yes, I, I, I think so. Okay, great. And, and thank you all for your questions and your insights. And, um, and the discussion around autonomous vehicles is really interesting. Um, and Phil mentioned the dystopia. You could have a world where it's just back-to-back -back cars driving around trying to avoid paying for parking. Um, the next question that I have, and this may be a vote, an unofficial vote. It's, you know, I just want to get people's ideas here. It's not, the question is one seat ride to Denver versus more frequent service. And so let's say that you could do, uh, I see Berenice has her hand up. So I'm sure you want to give yes. her a second. Yep. I was um, wondering this idea, if it's possible to have like food trucks next to the parking lots, then we create business opportunities and, you know, people can have a taco or whatever food they want while waiting the bus. So this would also, you know, contribute to economic development for, for the plan. Awesome. Great idea. And that is something that we could include maybe in the uh, stations area toolkit. So thank you so much for raising that up. And then there's the equity side of it and other stuff too. And I see Lisa has her hand up now. Yeah, just quickly, um, kind of piggybacking a little bit off of what Bernice mentioned, just from uh, that also creates, I think, greater 
safety for people that um, may have been involved in some RTD projects in, in the past in the Denver area where there's light rail stations that are very solitary located under like overpasses and things like that. And just thinking from a safety standpoint of who feels safe to be at those places, you know, after dark and whatnot. But if there's specifically economic activity and things like that, that are, you know, drawing people and there's more people around that also creates a greater sense of safety for people to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. These are great things to include in the stations area toolkit. <laughs> I feel like we need to send it to you for review for ideas as soon as it's closer up to the end. I um, 100% agree. Great, great ideas. Adam? Any, yep. Yeah, just really quickly, I want to also say that I have commuted between Longmont and Boulder via bus. I've also taken the bus along 287. And something important to me is accessibility. So that is being able to get to the bus stop. And the way I do that is by using a bike. And so I'd like to know if you can include ways to store the bike on the bus, um, similar to how RTD has that in the front of the bus, um, but also having the possibility to put it under the bus or somewhere in the bus if the front were to be full. So we're looking at multiple options. Um, right now, RTD runs the coaches, which are smooth, but they load slow and they unload slow and there's limited bike capacity. We're also looking at Arctics, those bendy buses. And, you know, one option with those is that you can bring the bicycle right in side of the bus. And so you just roll right on and then you can hang your bike up. I'm not saying that we're going to do that. I'm just saying it's something that has been discussed at a small level um, but addressing bikes is something that definitely needs to be done. And another thing that I've heard is when people are five foot five and 115 pounds uh, and they're trying to pull it off of there and they're feeling rushed that it's really difficult. So I think, I think you raise a really good point. And then as far as the bike parking goes around the area, um, that's already, that's included in the stations area toolkit. And it's something that Boulder County has done quite a bit of. And I believe um, Boulder County is, has some agreements with Longmont on a couple of those as well. So um, there's those, there's the long-term bike parking, the bike shelters, which I believe are coded. And then there is the short-term bike parking, which is just like a bike staple or a U-rack right outside. And so, yeah, bike parking, um, that's something I think that we've got a pretty good handle on and just need to implement. Uh, the bigger question is the, yeah, putting the bike on the bus or under the bus or in the bus and what are the load times and what are the convenience factors and things like that. So thank you for raising that question and then routes to it as well. So, yeah. Okay. I see another hand up. So, so Jeff, do we, do we know what the, um, yeah, what's the how much is the cost in terms of a, uh, of a bus how much is the cost for um you know the equipment itself versus the labor for having um you know a bus driver i just because because in some ways the frequency question to me is you know kind of depends on that that ratio because if if you could have smaller buses <laughs> that were more fully occupied and, and operating much more often that would be really ideal but it requires until we have autonomous buses, um, more labor. So, you know, you asked the question about frequency. I, that, you know, like I take the, when the weather's not good, I take the J and that bus basically comes every hour. <laughs> and so it's like, and you miss it. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna have to walk home and then come back to the bus stop. Um, so being more frequent, I think would help ridership and everything. But I know that that frequency obviously affects costs both because you need more equipment, but especially, um, you know, the, the labor of having extra bus drivers. Well, let's say we have a hundred service hours, right? We can take those hundred service hours and we could um, drive right into Denver and then provide 30 minute headways, you know, or say we have a set number of service hours, a hundred is maybe not the, the right, but we have a set number of service hours that we do. And you can go all the way into Denver 
and you have 30 minute headways with those service hours. Or you can go from Longmont to Broomfield back to Longmont. So instead of continuing on to Denver, you come back to Longmont, which then increases the frequency of bus that you have, but you have to transfer. And so you're dependent on, you know, that other bus being there. And it's great when it's there, but it's awful when it leaves right when you arrive. So that's, that's a great question. And so that's what I'd like to talk about now is one seat rides into Denver. And let's just say, hypothetically, you would have a 30 minute ride into Denver. And these are hypothetical number, or you would have 30 minute headways into Denver, just for, for this exercise, um, not modeled or anything. Or, you know, instead of running that bus into Denver, you bring the bus back up to Longmont and you're able to use those service hours tighter and get 15 minute headways. Which one of those is more important? Having the frequent service where you don't have to have the map or, um, or you know, the one seat ride so you can just get on and go. I see two participants have their hands raised, so I will. Let the chair. Yeah, go ahead, on. Jim. <clears throat> and then Charles. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that to me, you know, so I, I live in Longmont and I work in Boulder and I've done the J and the Bolt combinations for a lot of the time that I've lived there. And I also bike back and forth. And the thing that I, th I always think about is that that question depends on the time of day you're talking about. You know, I think the J is a perfect example where it, it, um, in terms of where I can get on the J and where the J drop me off, drops me off, it's convenient, but it also gives you an entire tour of the front range um, uh, along the way, stopping at a, a lot of places and it doesn't come very often. And it seems to me that like a, a, you know, something like that, where we know that there's a lot of people that live in Longmont that work uh, at CU or downtown Boulder. So we're going to have door, you know, single seat service during so that people can get to work at normal working times and get home after normal working times that that makes sense but then in the the other time where maybe i'm going to denver because i want to go to a rockies game or something like that it's a little bit more of a um you know having to having to 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 change a mode of transportation in broomfield or something is isn't really a big deal to me it's the the daily stuff that i think is where you know, the, the commutes that people are, we're trying to get people to do their daily commuting. It seems like that's the biggest impact is to do their daily commuting in something besides a private car. And, and, um, and one seat ride is important for the daily commuting is what you're saying? Well, I mean, I, I think that, I think that being able to get from, you know, like the J, you know, the J from 23rd in Longmont to the first stop at CU is like, over an hour and a half. And, um, and you know, if I, if that's like, I, I can bike that distance in less time. And, um, and if I drive my personal car, it's about 30, 35 minutes. Um, I live in Lor North Longmont. So, mm -hmm. um, so if, uh, if there were well-timed connections, maybe I wouldn't care so much, but to me, it's getting that time down for the, the regular stuff that is important. And whether or not, you know, and, and it seems like if there are ways that we know, oh, a lot of, you know, a ton of people who, I think it's something like 700 CU employees live in Longmont. It's something around that. I, I don't know where I heard that number, but it's, it's, it's around that number. And if you think about most of them, probably most of us probably drive our cars. So maybe if there's a way to do a single seat thing that, that takes, takes these big bites out of, you know, the, the people that live in Longmont but work at maybe the federal, I don't know, you know, somewhere else. It seems like there's ways to take big bites out of it with single seat service that doesn't operate all day, but really targets those commuting times. Our jargon, we use is service patterns and service, um, yeah, like the LX that takes you directly in. What would you say, Phil? Interlining. Interlining, right, yeah. Um, that's great. I saw there was another hand up. Not sure who that was. I think it was taken down. Okay. 
Um, and, and and real quick, just that what just a second what uh, Jim was saying. It, the weird thing with the J is it's almost like a it's it starts as a local and it acts like a local, then it turns into a regional. And so um, if if you're trying to get like a regional service and you're on the north side of Longmont, you have to go through the the local kind of <laughs> aspect of it for half an hour to get to the south southwest part of Longmont. And and like Charles said, if you if you happen to miss it, the it, it actually stops right outside of my building here. And it's like I can either leave work a little bit earlier than I'm supposed to and catch it, or I can stay at work a lot longer than I want to and catch it. But either way, it's you know, by the time I get on that until the time I get home, it's approaching two hours because of the bus and the other connections, which which um, is a big deterrent in me deciding to to take it, I unfortunately. So there definitely needs to be work with making sure that the networks are aligning well and that the buses are coming and hopefully these treatments that we put in makes the bus more predictable. I think one issue that we deal with right now and particularly on the LD is that it could take you 30 minutes to get to Broomfield. It could take you 47 minutes to get to Broomfield. And so we're hoping to help make these more predictable which could help make those transfers more predictable. And so what I'm hearing from you all is that the network is really important to use that network and be able to have those transfers, but during peak times to have, um, have those one seat rides available to major destinations. Yeah, and I, I'm so, I know that I'm talking a lot, but I just, I, I'm very, I, and I'm, I'm sure you guys already do this. I don't wanna, I don't wanna be condescending in saying this, but I'd be very curious in knowing you know, if you, if I did, uh, if I drew a line of everybody's commute from Longmont or to Longmont in a day, it seems like there would be these big groupings of places people are heading at roughly the same time together. And I've, I've complained that I work for CU and I've complained to CU every time they send out transit service about like, why aren't you organizing a, a bus that goes from 8th and Kaufman to CU and gets us here to start a work day at eight o'clock? There would be, if you know you could do that in a half hour, uh, everybody would want to take it. No, I think that, I think yeah. that's, I think that's in the plans actually. With that's great to hear. So. That's great to hear. Cause I, th I, it seems like we could do a lot by targeting some of these, like the, you know, like the big hubs. Maybe Phil can speak more to yeah, that. I was going to say though, it might, it might be very beneficial to this group if we send you out the, the plans for the bus rapid transit service along 119, because it, uh, you know, the J the J bus goes away. There's more direct service to see you. Uh, I think it would really benefit this group to see that. So I'll send it through uh, uh, Lisa, and we'll get it out to you all. Thanks. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And that's 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 one of the first improvements that's being worked on, is is those types of things and. Um, trying to build that network. Um, any other discussion on you know, frequency of service versus one seat rides? Anybody have any other opinions that we haven't heard from or other ideas or? Bernice? Um, Jeff, um, mm -hmm. before I forget, I don't know if within the um, bilingual feedback that you guys presented, you got any any comments about all, especially people of color living in Well County and how, you know, there are not enough uh, public transportation. I know a lot of Latino workers live in Firestone, Frederick. So hopefully after this um, project, if it's successful, this will create opportunities to collaborate with Well County in creating more options for those communities living in the East. Thank you, Berenice. Um, there's another project, 52. <laughs> Colorado 52, we're working on a planning study for that and transit is being brought up along 52. Um, and so maybe we could have something connect over there. There's also been discussion around extending 119. Um, we come up with service provider um, boundaries once once we get outside of there and so for example to get uh 
over to 119, Longmont would either need to annex their city and provide all the services and, you know, it's not sustainable or a good idea, um, or the voters would need to approve it and they wouldn't. And so, or we can look for another provider. So I guess when we are looking um, at Weld County, we're mostly looking along 52. And I will also say that something else is that to look at is CDOT is working on an outrider uh, through Weld County that starts in Greeley and then I believe stops in either Hudson or Firestone, one of those two, and then and then continues over into Boulder County. So um, CDOT, outrider, Weld County would be sort of the Google term there. So thank you for that input. That's really important. And uh, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, Jeff, I just had a brief question about accessibility. Are you also doing anything to ensure equal access to the public transportation? I'm thinking of things like making sure there's some amount of affordable housing near the transit centers and things like that. So housing is a hot topic that we don't talk about as this as transportation planners so much especially with the county i think there's probably more leeway within the city um, and it's up to the individual cities i suppose is what i should say um, when we talk about this when we are planning this route yeah that's a great idea you know in i in a perfect world you would have fast transit and you would have you know mixed income apartments around there um, we are using existing zoning um, for different areas like Lafayette and Broomfield uh, and I, Longmont does have some good ideas and maybe Phil has some stuff that he would like to add on that. Just really quickly, we do uh, work. We have been actually going through a pretty elaborate and aggressive rezoning process uh, along this whole corridor. Uh, Main Street is really seen as the best place to redevelop these kinds of apartments and the higher density because we do have the existing infrastructure and we do have those kind of, um, you know, the, the, the transit lines are there. We just need to enhance them and make them better. And, and what Jeff is talking about uh, leads us to that next step of making them better. So we are working aggressively to allow the zoning that, that will, um, will, will, will uh, incentivize people to build higher and more dense, densely along these corridors, but not need more roadways to get around. And I, and I guess, thanks, thanks Phil for, for that and up zoning. Um, Longmont's great. I really enjoy living here. Um, one thing that the county is doing, um, Boulder County Housing and Human Services, I believe they're called, over on Kaufman, there is that large crane that you can see up in the air near downtown. And that is going to be, I believe, around 73 units. Um, and those are going to be, I think, mixed income. So I think they go from studio up to two, maybe three bedroom apartments in there. And so that's something that Boulder County uh, is doing where we can to provide that housing. But um, the zoning is really important. Um. Polly, I see you have your hand raised. I want to make a real quick comment uh, on, I'm, I'm curious about um, kiosks, uh, ways to buy tickets. Um, I, it, I find that buying a ticket to get on the bus is, it, it's difficult. Um, there, there aren't kiosks at every bus stop uh, where I can use a, use a card if I don't have exact change. Um, there's, I, I can't get change. And, um, and there's no way to, to pay electronically on the bus. Um, for those of us who don't have the advantage of an EcoPass card, who really value <laughs> transportation, I'm, I'm curious if there's um, it, plans in the works to, to make it more accessible. So there are several different options. And thank you for bringing up those details. This is, this is why I, uh, I think it's valuable to come speak all of you. And this is why I appreciate it, is to get those very fine grain details, um, like the exact change, <laughs> or you put in the 20 and you're paying 20 bucks. 
Um, so these these are the types of things that are really important to know. So thank you, thank you for for doing that. RTD is moving more towards mobile ticketing um, and making sure that you can have the tickets in advance. Um, one issue with the mobile ticketing is cash payers and people and unbanked. And so how can you manage that? And so having the kiosks up at the front, uh, we have a couple of different areas that we're taught that, that we're looking at within the stations area toolkit. And this is just very broad. And I, and I'm going to make a comment on ticket vending machines right now, because I have it pulled up. Um, so, uh, give change for cash payments. Okay. So I've just added that comment. Thank you. Um, but we've, we've talked about it. We're very broadly on the prepayment stuff. You can go all the way up to fare zones, which is on the, you know, most built up end of side of things where you would have to pay to get into the station. And maybe you would scan your tick, your card or put money in and get money out and get a ticket. And then you walk in and then everybody inside there is waiting for the bus. That's on an extreme end. Um, are things that, and, and Phil, this is probably new to you because of the, this is in the stationary toolkit, which we haven't circulated yet. Um, and then other things are the prepayment, meaning that we um, could either use electronic smart card, cell phone based stuff, as I mentioned, or the ticket vending machines with receipts, and then you use that receipt um, or a combination of those. But I think I think the important part that I'm really hearing from you is that they give exact change and or use a card is the most important. Yeah, using a card would be or some sort of electronic would be just so valuable to like I have to go to the ATM and then go to buy something at the gas station so that I can just it it's not uh, convenient. Uh, it's not a good way to attract riders. Yeah. So thanks. Hey, you know, give change. What a, what a phenomenon, huh? Uh, yeah. And uh, I guess, um, yeah. Anything else about that? You know, I mean, pain on the bus, should we like just completely get rid of payment on the bus? Or, so you, you have or to I can swipe my phone or give a card or something on the bus, but uh, Polly has ideas and so does Adam. Berenice has her hand raised. I used to do that for seniors and people who still struggle with that digital divide. We should keep cash available. I'm sorry, Polly. Yeah. No, cash is good as long as you can get change. With change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no cobra doors here. Other people had Polly or someone had a. Well, I, I was just going to, well, I forget what I was going to tell you. Oh, two things. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Kate, because, you know, the Bay Area Rapid Transit has, ha, has had kiosks and automatic cart. You just take, you take your cart in and run through the turnstile and you're on, you know, or hold it up to the bus driver. You're, no problem. Uh, Washington, D.C., same thing. Any idiot, well, except me, has has no problem going in, sticking some money in, and then you take the card. When it runs out of money, you put some more money in it. But you just show up with your card. But you're right, too. We do need a cash thing. And in fact, in Japan, everybody just pays things with cash. It, it's both ways. But um, it's faster for the bus driver. Having been a bus driver, I can tell you, you don't want to, you're not there to do cash transactions or help and people figure arguments. out the card yeah <laughs> but um so you know and the difference is in washington dc i take the i take transportation everywhere i went to los angeles they have a beautiful <laughs> old trains uh, a beautiful old uh transit station but trying to get the card system to work I wind up in tears. And so I just said, what the hell? I'll walk home because I, <laughs> I can't, you know, nobody helps you. And the system is incredibly 
complicated. It's, it's ludicrous. And it's just a matter of, that's how you get passengers by making it easy. Longmont bought the uh, fare box just so everybody in this town can get to work. And, the, and so within Longmont, you don't have to pay anything. The ridership, this is enormously helpful for people who are low income because they spend a fortune on the bus and they don't have a fortune. They, they need to just be able to get on the bus without feeling ashamed or something, you know. Um, but what I was going to say to Adam is that uh, the original idea, you know, down on Main Street, Main and First, uh, there is the giant complex that finally got built and it's called Main Street Station because it's supposed to be across from our train station. <laughs> and the train station was also supposed to have housing on the top of it. That was the plan. And we've had those plans for years. All we need is for RTD to actually bring us our train <laughs> and then we could build it. But I mean, if you had housing right in that complex in the the um uh train station it'd be terrific but we do have some housing it's just very expensive but yeah we can be so much more creative in the way we have transit and tr and uh housing combined because that makes it better for everybody yeah thanks for that i moved out here and was searching and searching for a way to take the bus and downtown longmont and the street grid was the closest i could find so i walked to coffin and then on the bart um bay area rapid transit in dc i think they use the fare zones and where you pay and then you put your ticket in and then you can get through and so that's sort of what we're talking that's a high level of investment and so but um that's something that is in the stations area toolkit. We'll run through the stakeholder working group and see what people think and uh, see if we should keep it in the toolkit and maybe maybe it will advance with time. And then on the housing side of things um, and especially first and main patients. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm gonna move along now to the final question. Um, if there's time, is there time? Or are uh, we finished? Yeah, the, we do have a few more items on the agenda, everyone, but um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and and get this last question in. Adam, I see you had your hand up. You wanted to say something. Yeah, really quick, Jeff, could you also consider having real-time tracking of the buses if possible? Hey, hot dog, how about that, huh? Yeah. I, I, would, I would second that. All right. Does that exist already in the uh, transit app, Jeff? Yeah, Mid I thought I could see it. I, it's I, not super reliable. Yeah. Okay. That might be true. I, I think some of the buses have the trackers in them and then some of them are based on where they should be, but that's not my expertise. What we're looking at at the stations and our thing, including the stations area toolkit, aside from the app is having what's called a public information display, or there's other words for it, uh, signage to let you know how long it is till the bus comes. So another thing in the stations area toolkit, not a promise, not something we're going to do, but something that it's like something we could do. Um, the final one that I have is, and I don't want to take all of your time here, the frequency of stops versus uh, speed. So if we can have few stops and high speed, and you mentioned the local service, the regional also acting as a local route. Um, so fewer stops, higher speed, um, maybe more accessible with more stops and slower speeds, which is more important to you? Fewer stops, higher speeds, more stops, slower speeds. And then where the stops are. If the stop is in front of your house, that's the only one you want. Exactly. <laughs> I, think, I think it also depends on whether or not the, the, like the bus rapid transit includes uh, local routes that help people get to the bus rapid transit. Because I wouldn't necessarily need a bus to stop on in front of my house if I could take a bus to where it went and that was regular and easy. So like, I, I don't mind the super fast bus only stopping a few times if it's not that difficult to get to the places where it only stops a few times. Needs to work with the local network. It just network keeps coming up as important throughout this entire theme. Anybody else have, I, I see Adam has his hand up. I'm not sure if I'm the one who's supposed to call on you or Kate. He certainly can. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. 
I was just wondering, is there a third possibility to have both? I know, for example, on US 287, they had the LD buses, and I think there was like an LDX or something like that for Express. And so there was an option to tour the front range, but also one where you could just get to the destination a lot quicker. Great. Different interlining, I suppose, was the term Phil used, new term for me. Um, so different, yeah, just making sure we get where we need to go and yeah, I, I think that will be an option. And there's been some other other things that have come up as well along along this area. Uh, and any any other discussion on sort of you know number of stations, slower bus, lots of stations, slower bus, fewer stations, faster bus. I'm not seeing any more hands. So I'm gonna thank you very much for letting me be here. Um, if we could put the presentation back up and go to the last slide, please. Uh, that has my contact information on it, which is why I would like to do this. That way you all have my info if you want a screenshot or whatever. Um, but it's uh, right there at the bottom, uh, Jeff Butts, jbutts at bouldercounty.org. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, any complaints, feel free to email me. I would like to keep in touch and then please visit boco.org 287 and sign up for our listserv. There's a big red button there. So boco, as in Boulder County, that's how we shorten it, .org, and then 287 planning because we are planning for 287 right now. So those two things are sort of the calls to action. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me here and um, good uh, best wishes in uh, your sustainability adventures. <laughs> Thanks so thank much, you. Jeff. That was thank a, you very a much, great Jeff. presentation, great discussion. Really appreciate you being here and leading us through it. Thank you for allowing me your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we are now at other business on the agenda. Lisa, are you uh, taking us through the follow-up action? From yeah, the yeah, it's just real quick. And first of all, I really like that sign off of good luck on your sustainability <laughs> adventures. <laughs> Start using that. New uh, this was just a quick question. I know our main meeting was pretty packed. There was a lot of stuff and I know Mary's not on today, but there seemed to be some particularly particular interest or commentary that there wasn't a lot focused on uh, the pesticide aspect of the conversation in May. And I just wanted to ask the group, um, you know, Polly had brought up at the very end because of some stuff happening at the state level, it looks like maybe there is some new opportunities to um, bring forth some additional um, codes or regulations locally around pesticides. And I just wanted to ask this group do you want me to bring something to a future agenda that's specifically focused on that? And if, if we want to potentially make a recommendation to city council to look at a, you know, a pesticide, um, whatever it might be, resolution or something along those lines. Um, so it's just a quick question. I don't, I, we don't have a ton of time for discussion, but it's a question of, do you all want me to bring something specific back around pesticides and actions this group might take on that front? I would vote yes. How would others, how do others feel about that? I, I would as well, especially if it seems like there's, uh, there's now changes in state law that would actually allow the city to consider its own policy for probably the first time in quite a long yes. time. It seems like that would be Policy a very... was the word I was looking for. Thanks, Jim. Sorry <laughs> that I couldn't think that. Great. Um, yeah, Adam. I, I agree as well. And I think it would be helpful to hear a little bit about the state policy. Great. All right, sounds good. I'll do that. Perfect. Thank and you. then um, the next, well, go ahead, Kate. Sorry, I don't want to. No, no, no. Take over your You're up next. Keep going. <laughs> um, the land acknowledgement piece, I'm going to pass off to um, Polly for that. Oh, Annie, did you have, sorry, did you have a, there was a comment on the other piece? Um, I didn't know if items from staff. Um, yeah, that, that's what I. Oh, yeah. Thank you. My own revision. Great. Um, 
And Lisa, I, I didn't know if you wanted to introduce the subject of future meetings and remote versus hybrid versus going back. That didn't end up on the agenda. Mm -hmm. I think we were still waiting for information back from other folks on that. So I was not planning to bring that up today. Okay. Oh. Um, but thank you for the reminder from my own revision to the agenda. <laughs> um, so I am actually going to pass it off to, um, I guess, Tim and Atra. Um, so we have an opportunity for a pretty large grant through the Department of Energy that we are looking for um, an approval today for a letter of support from this board on that. It's a very quick turnaround that we're trying to pull this application together. So I apologize to not get you information ahead of time, um, but it's also a huge opportunity um, and we do have one other thing on the agenda, so I, I want to keep this pretty brief, but I'll pass it to them real quick. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Good to see all of you. Um, I'll try to be pretty quick, but I, I think it's worth giving a, just a brief background on how we got here. Um, you know, following the transportation, the rollout of the transportation roadmap for the carbon free and equitable transportation uh, that Francie and Phil had, had worked so hard in getting together, we wanted to kind of start acting on that. And one of the things we wanted to ramp up was, you know, communicating with other organizations uh, locally, regionally, nationally uh, to help us with those efforts. One of those groups is the Denver Metro Clean Cities organization, and they help. Um, cities uh, in the areas surrounding Denver to um, increase their adoption of EVs and build stations and have fleet planning and do outreach and education and all sorts of electric vehicle transportation. Um, they offer a lot of support to a cities in those areas. So we reached out to them uh, probably six weeks ago, I guess. Um, and, during, and we explained all the things that we were doing. They're super interested. There's a lot of ways we can continue to engage with them um, on a lot of levels. But at that meeting, they had brought up the opportunity uh, that we could pursue uh, was a, a Department of Energy grant for um, a uh, electric vehicle transition um, period of three years to, to have Longmont be a model city for electric vehicle transitioning. Um, and it's a substantial grant, it's a $4 million grant, but it also requires a, an equal cost share. Uh, the good news on that is that the cost share doesn't have to be money only, it could be in kind services. And we also um, have a number of partners that will help us uh, complete certain efforts uh, in, that, in, those, in different areas to uh, use grant money and also donate some of their own time, like the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, Denver Metro Clean Cities, uh, Sweep. There's we have a bunch of different entities that are already on board. Uh, Via is another one, I think, Lisa, right? For for um, local electric vehicle transportation. So we're we're engaging a lot of partners. Um, one thing that did come up during the calls, we had one week to turn around a concept paper for the Department of Energy in order to kind of frame out what we were intending to do it over the three years, and we managed to get that done. And it took the Department of Energy a few weeks to, and this is nationwide uh, opportunity. So a few weeks later, um, and Department of Energy went through all the various concept papers and actually we were selected to, as one of the cities, to go for a full application um, for this. Um, there was a lot of reasons why they had uh, cities not go forward due to whatever plans they had in place or information available, but we were selected to uh, move forward with the application, which is due in mid-July. And like I said, it's $4 million with eight million, another $4 million cost, cost share. But we're, we're looking into things, and I don't know, Adra, can you pull up, can we pull up a, a, a document on this meeting, or does it have to be done through uh, staff for? Tim, I have the PDF that I can pull up. Oh, yeah, can you do that? Uh, I think we have a copy of the concept paper that kind of outlines uh, a bunch of the different items we're looking at rather than me just trying to rattle them off from memory, which I'll do a terrible job of. Um, but um, yeah, if you scroll down a, a little bit here. Yeah, keep going. There's like a bulleted list that says key items or something. Right here, here we go. The key aspects, and you can see there's a lot of them because this is a substantial grant, but we're, we're actually working with multiple departments in the city, transportation and fill and, and uh, Sandy and Cash on fleet um, projects, 
uh, environmental planning, and of course, you know, Lisa's group, uh, Andy's group of uh, sustainability and all the opportunities we have with them. And also along my power communications, I'm kind of heading up that area. And we're just looking to, um, I, I particularly, we're going to try to focus on under potentially underserved communities um, and areas and, and, and residents um, for, you know, electric vehicle opportunities, but we're doing across the board, just a lot of things we're, we're looking at um, from fleet planning, buying new vehicles on a, on a more rapid um, timeline, um, looking at, at developing a citywide mapping um, for, uh, you know, our electric distribution network and aligning that with opportunities for the city to engage in station uh, installations, um, uh, multi-family installations and infrastructure. Uh, you can just go through this list. We'd be happy to send this off if it hasn't already been sent to the group to kind of look at. But, but what would help us a great deal in our application is uh, letter, our letters of support. And the city council, we're, we already developed one for city council. We're going to present, I think, at the next meeting to ask for their um, official letter of support uh, for this um, this grant application and we're you know seeing if you guys would be um okay with with providing um also providing a, a letter of support to try to, to just pursue the grant you know we're just filling out the application at this point it'll take several months for them to review and if we're approved it would be a, a project that we would undergo from late this year but through 20 2022 through 2024 it's a three-year opportunity but but what it can do is really fast track our transportation roadmap and and it really aligns well with our development of the roadmap because it includes exactly the types of points that the department of energy is looking to to provide like a model city for other cities around the country to move quickly towards uh, electric vehicle transition and transportation did i cover that all lisa and adara or is there anything else you guys want to add just add quickly, I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned that at the beginning, but the whole funding opportunity is to really help cities fast track their efforts towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we would be trying to kind of pull in some of our objectives that have been laid out in the equitable, trans equitable free, carbon free transportation roadmap and other plans and bringing them forward. And so this grant funding opportunity would help us do that. Um, so that's what the Biden administration is really trying to do with this grant effort is to accelerate cities' plans, give us more resources to enact what we already have got planned, but, you know, make that happen quicker. Um, and a large focus is making sure that EV access is more equitable across the city as well. So that these are the two main points of emphasis for this grant opportunity. And Denver Metro Clean Cities Coalition, they, they raised this with, with us a few weeks back saying that this would be a great opportunity because it addresses the air pollution along the front range. It increases um, our opportunities for diversity and inclusion in relationship to EV infrastructure, and it's gonna help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So they are really spearheading this in the sense that they think we have a very good chance of winning this grant. And Oh, and we've drafted a letter for you just in case you want to put your name to it. So you, that's in one of the attachments we provided for you. So it's really asking if you're willing to sign that off, if you feel comfortable with it. Can I, can I move that we, um, as a sustainability advisory board, um, uh, provide a letter of support for this proposal? I will second that motion. All in favor? I, I, I think you have our letter. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's, Fantastic. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. It's sounds exciting. like a great opportunity. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. doing that. Great. Thank you, Kate. We might need to follow up with you specifically to figure out how to get a signature from you if it works to do a digital one, or sure. I would hope so at this point. But we'll we'll follow up with you on that. Cool. You know. Great. Thank you all. Okay. Um, do board members have any items? Um, uh, items for council, yes. Um, this is something that uh, Lisa uh, gave me and um, it's called land acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement statement. Um, 
And uh, I think I meant to send this to you, but um, um, Susie Hidalgo Farring also uh, read this aloud and city council uh, does support this. Um, here's the statement. We acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territories to, I'm sorry, territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that the first peoples have with this land. It is our commitment to face the injustices that happened when the land was taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. Um, so I could uh, send out that statement to all of you, but. Um, I uh, I believe what we're looking for is a, a letter in support of that from the Sustainability Advisory Board. Um, I'm not too clear on what's going to happen with this, except that it should be a resolution and um, it fits in nicely with our relationship with the Northern Arapaho people, but also of course, um, Boulder County as a whole has done a lot in the last uh, few years to try to address some of those issues. And, and we do hope have an, uh, an Indigenous Peoples Day. So this is a really, um, a very tiny way to just um, address the issue of the injustices that happened. Jim. Yeah, just, I just wanted to, sorry, can I add a little bit more information there for folks? Um, so this was also something that had been discussed in different parts of the organization and the museum mm -hmm. in particular um, was interested in uh, drafting a land acknowledgement statement and council member Hidalgo Faring, as Polly mentioned, uh, brought this, the draft that Polly just read to the museum advisory board um, as well. And they, they approve, uh, um, approved or essentially motion to approve the draft statement. We right. thought that um, bringing it to this board as well, because yes. we of the connection to sustainability, the focus that you all have particularly um, around equity seemed like another board that seemed really relevant to bring this right. to and provide um, approval for. They also gave would give it more strength when taking it back to council to say both of these boards have approved this statement. Um, as for, it'll be then up to council to determine uh, the the breadth and scope of how the land acknowledgement statement itself wants to be used, but we wanted to have an official statement from the organization mm -hmm. that we can utilize for events. And I think in particular, in looking forward to the fall with the um, sister cities arrangement with the Northern Arapaho, I believe that's all gonna be finalized in the fall and wanted to have this statement in particular completed mm -hmm. by or um, approved by them. Jim, did you? I was just going to say, I think that that's great. I, um, it's great to hear that this council is approving this and it's moving forward. And I don't know if other people want to discuss it, but if not, I will, I will certainly move to um, provide a letter of support for the land acknowledgement statement. I'd, I'd second that motion. Great. I, is there any discussion that you want to have on that, Adam? I'd like to say I support that as well. And I'd like to know um, what do the Northern Arapaho folks think about this? What sort of feedback? Do they have anything to add or any um, things that like, they like to provide for advice or guidance? Um, I don't think they have even heard about it. I, <laughs> I intend to uh, write them because um, there are a number of issues I, I'm concerned about um, when we have a turnover of council this fall. And, uh, but I do want to let them know that this is happening. And I, I think it would be also very useful to write um, some of the chiefs from the Cheyenne and also the Ute tribe. We, the Ute were everywhere in Colorado. And um, so, uh, and there are many others as well. Many other tribes used this land. So um, yeah, that's, a, I'll make that my little project is to write them. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, so all, all in favor? Aye. 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 
we will support that. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that to us. Um, so that brings us to close to the end of the agenda. The last item on the agenda is uh, just to bring your attention to the informational items that are included in your board packet. And with that, um, would anybody like to make a motion to adjourn? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, I kind of missed the opportunity early, but could I ask a quick question of Tim while, while we're still here? What's the due date on, or the deadline for the proposal to the DOE? Oh, it's July 13th, I believe. Is that right, Lisa, or 12th or 13th? July 12th, 3 p.m. 12th. Yeah. Okay. It's a quick do, one. Do, are, are you guys all fine in terms of having enough help uh, to get that prepared and, and input and everything? I know you have NREL involved. They're definitely experts on, on many aspects of this. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we actually talked about today. It's going to be tight, but we're all we're trying to get our line items uh, from the various groups of what efforts we expect to put forward. And uh, Denver Metro has reached out to a bunch of the partners. So so we're we're okay. on our way, but I can't say for sure we're going to do it comfortably. <laughs> okay. But if, I mean, uh, what are you offering a help? So so one thing that we do, uh, I, I have two new DOE grants this year, so I'm doing pretty well on that. But one thing we sometimes do is have what we call red teams. DOE is used to these internal red teams, which um, kind of do an internal review of the proposals before, you know, with enough time to be able to make uh, you know, iterations and modifications to the proposal before it's submitted. So I'd be happy to look over and comment if, uh, if that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that's, I would think that's a great idea. Uh, assuming we can get everything on time, we will, we'll, let's keep in touch on that. I think we have yeah. a lot of work yet to do, but um, certainly um, some other eyes on it, I think would be helpful. Thank you, Charles. Great. Thanks. Thanks. While we're jumping around um, in the agenda, I, I just the on the part uh, Lisa on the the partnerships that you presented the the um, on the zero waste resolution update is Recycle Colorado included in there? I didn't have them on my list, but that's great. Yeah, and I know Charlie from our our sanitation manager is connected to them. So thank you for reminding me about that group. Sure thing. Okay. Um, so, motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'm doing all the motions. Um, I'll move to adjourn. I did second. I'm that. doing all the seconds. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had to beat me to it. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, Thanks staff for being here, uh, guiding yeah. us through this great meeting. Um, appreciate it.